The way we lead impacts the way people live. This world needs truly human leadership. The only way that your business strategy is going to thrive is if you have humans running at full capacity with all of their effort and all of their talent to make that business strategy happen. And if you don't know how the humans in your span of care within your organization are doing um, and the ways in which they are thriving or not in order to achieve those goals, it's simply not going to happen. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. You can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and threads at Barry Waymiller. And find our podcast articles and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. Chapman & Co. Leadership Institute is Barry Waymiller's consulting arm that specializes in helping other organizations unleash the extraordinary in their businesses and their people. They do this by helping those organizations identify, develop, and equip their leaders. You can learn more about Chapman & Co. at ccoleadership.com. One of the ways Chapman & Co. helps to equip leaders in an organization is with information. One of the ways they can provide that information is by administering an organizational culture survey. And to talk about the what's, why's, and how's of organizational culture surveys, I talked to Chapman & Co. survey expert Morgan Miller. So talk to me about a culture survey. How would Chapman & Co. Leadership Institute define it and define this type of survey, and how does it work? Yeah, so uh, at Chapman & Co., our culture survey um, you might know it by an engagement survey, a workplace survey, an opinion survey, um, but it's designed to give us a sense of what's going on in an organization through individual employee experiences. So we have a saying that uh, the Chapman & Co. Organizational Culture Survey is a voice for employees, insights for executives, and a path forward for leaders. Uh, and while that sounds like a kitschy marketing statement, it's actually pretty true of saying, hey, your employees are experiencing things, and especially when we get to be a larger organization, we don't have purview into those individual experiences that they're having. So this is a way to say, hey, we care about you, and we want you to have space to tell us how's it going. Uh, do you like things that you want us to keep doing? Do you not like things that we need to work on? Um, so really giving space for employees to feel heard, uh, to provide their perspective on all of those things. Insights for executives, okay, do you really know what's going on in your organization? We'll find that most executives will tell us, yep, I have a gut feel. Um, but nowhere else do we use gut feel to determine what's actually happening. So an executive gets this 30,000 foot view of what's going on in their organization and how that varies across different types of team members, locations, countries, etc. Um, and then the most important part being action. So the survey is designed so that local leaders on their local teams can say, okay, what do we need to do in order to improve that experience or continue the great experience that's already happening? So this, I mean, this could be pretty important to the health of a company. How important do you think it would be? The only way that your business strategy is going to thrive is if you have humans running at full capacity with all of their effort and all of their talent to make that business strategy happen. And if you don't know how the humans in your span of care within your organization are doing um, and the ways in which they are thriving or not in order to achieve those goals, it's simply not going to happen. So who, who all should be involved in this? Like, is it certain sectors, certain leaders, like who all should be involved? From a participation perspective, the answer is everyone. Uh, back to the BW saying of everybody matters. Every voice matters and has space. So we want all of the participation. I don't care if you're an intern, if you're part-time, if you're a contract, you have an experience at this place of work uh, and we wanna be sure we capture that. From a leadership perspective, this usually looks like your HR leader spearheading the effort. Uh, but the only way that this works successfully is if you have buy-in across leadership. 
And so we need this to be not something that HR does, not some checkbox exercise we run a survey, but really the buy-in across leadership that says, hey, this is going to inform how we better our efforts in finance, in operations, in marketing, um, no matter the function, it says, hey, I have humans in my span, span of care. And so this is an effort I am invested in as well. So Chapman & Co. is part of Barry Waymiller. And in the past, our company has been really hesitant to do culture surveys. Um, we've started, we've now started implementing them throughout our organization, uh, as we'll hear in this podcast. But can you give us a little history on that and talk through why we thought it was necessary and how it's affected the company at a higher level? Yeah, so the history of running a culture survey at Barry Waymiller is probably my favorite interaction with Bob to date, in which I was sent in to chat with him about this effort we were hoping to run, to really elevate the fact that everybody matters. Bob Chapman, our CEO, by the way. Yes. <laughs> no pressure, of course. <laughs> Uh, and I'm feeling really good, values aligned, have this whole spiel, and Bob looks at me and says, okay, that's fine. I just need you to know I hate service. <laughs> and with that ringing endorsement, <laughs> we moved forward. Um, but Bob hates service for a really good reason, which is that Bob really values listening. Uh, and he didn't want a digital 15-minute engagement, 15 minute or less set of questions to replace the act of listening in which all of the team members within our span of care feel truly heard, feel really listened to, uh, feel seen and empathized with. Um, and it was really important for me to stress to Bob that this is not a replacement of listening. But a survey, when you become a global company with 14,000 team members, uh, it's going to be pretty difficult to hear all of those needs all of the time. And a survey is a way that we can hone into where do we need to go listen more? Where do we need to listen better? Uh, and that has been really the journey of Barry Waymiller since starting the survey is getting a really crystal clear idea of who needs resources and where and how do we better support team members in their specific areas. Now, and we called it the Every Voice Matters campaign um, and I think senior leadership has really, it's really made a difference. They're really, they really are been able to look at some areas they may not have looked at before. Yes. Yeah, so Every Voice Matters has been a really pivotal way to take team member experiences, have a data-driven method to make decisions about those team member experiences. So we're seeing changes in benefits policies. We're seeing added uh, employee support groups. We are seeing uh, specific continuous improvement efforts where folks had responded and said, hey, the processes here are not working. And so we have seen improvements across various functions of the business because we used a data-driven approach to tell us what was needed. And so that's been super exciting, I think, in terms of Every Voice Matters. And then important to note, too, that this isn't a one-and-done experience for Barry Waymiller. Uh, this was an effort that started in January of 2023, um, and just in the last month, I've still received communication saying, every voice matters. Here's an update for you. So using this to leverage continual listening and communication throughout the organization. So what would you tell a potential company that's looking at implementing a cultural survey in their organization? I would tell them, don't wait. Uh, the time to listen is now. You have an opportunity, uh, and not just in getting the data, but we always say a survey is an active engagement in and of itself. Um, the number of comments that came back and that come back across surveys that I run, let's say we ask, do you have any additional comments to share? And the comments that say, thank you for taking the time to ask my opinion. Uh, team members, it goes so far just to say, hey, we care about what you think and how this is going, and we're going to ask you about this. So I would say for any company considering running a culture survey, um, it's a really powerful experience for your team and is going to give you data uh, to take action. You use data in every other aspect of your business. You would never go without data to make decisions about your customers, your marketing, your finance, your operations. Um, and where you're making decisions without data about your team members every day. And they're the humans that are going to drive success. 
for your customers, for your marketing, for your operations, for your finance. Um, so this will fuel your success as a business uh, in many, many other ways. For the remainder of this podcast, we're going to do a deeper dive into organizational culture surveys with Morgan as she talks to Yasmeen, a people team leader from Barry Waymiller's BW Paper Systems company. They'll talk about the challenges in implementing an organizational culture survey, but they'll also talk about the ways the survey has affected their organization. And now, here's Yasmeen and Morgan. So my name is Yasmin, and I am the VP of People for one of Barry B. Miller's platforms um, called Paper Systems. And I have been with the company for a little over 12 years now, and I'm located out of Germany. And Paper Systems is a global company, so we have locations all around the world, in the US, Europe, Asia, and we support approximately 100 1,800 team members. And I think that's also what I enjoy most about my work, that I work very international. Um, I have connections with 15 members all around the globe. So that's what I enjoy most about my role. Very fun. Do you want to share the global reach that you have? Like who all is in your span of care? Where do they Mm -hmm. reside? Sure. So most of our team members are out of the 1,800, approximately 1,200 reside in the U.S. So also the majority of my team sits in the U.S. We have approximately 10 um, team members working in human resources in the U.S. And we also have a rather large team in, um, in Europe. So we have team members in Germany, Hungary, uh, Spain, Italy, and then we also have a team in Asia where we have locations in China, Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia. We also have um, a team in Latin America, Mexico, Brazil. So basically any continent, we have it covered. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. What an impact to be able to have. Um, Okay, so for those who don't know, This is the first time in the last year, a little over a year ago, is the first time that this company ran a culture survey. First time we took quantitative data, had an opportunity to collect that. What insights were you hoping to gain from implementing that survey? So I think we were hoping to really get quantitative data on how our team members around the globe experience our culture. And we were also hoping to hear, to hear from the teams directly where we should focus our efforts on. So I think most of the topics that came up through the survey, they were not a huge surprise. We kind of knew that those were areas that we need to improve. But the survey really helped us to prioritize where we should focus our efforts. And through listening sessions, which we had done before, that was a great way of getting qualitative data, but it didn't really give us that quantitative data that we needed to, yeah, see where we need to focus on. So that was great doing that survey. Yeah. So you mentioned listening sessions and if there are listeners out there who have been listening to this podcast for any number of time, they know that listening is a really core value of the Barry Way Miller companies. Um, And I think there's actually a fear that in running a culture survey, that we would actually replace the listening that we so value to go and hear team members' lived experiences. Uh, how do you ensure that your surveys in running them, that those complement our practice of listening rather than replace them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think both the survey and listening sessions are two completely different things and they don't replace each other, but each of them have their own um, advantages. So for us, I think the survey was a great way to really reach every single team member and to give everyone a chance to share their voice. And since the survey was anonymous, I think it hopefully also encouraged some team members to share their voice who maybe would not have done so if we had asked them directly through a listening session. And I think also the survey helped us to compare data across locations since everyone received exactly the same questions. It helped us to learn about best practices of other locations. Um, and you don't get that sort of comparison um, to other forms of listening. But nevertheless, I don't think it's replacing um, listening to team members in one-on-one conversations or in group sessions, um, because I think through a conversation, you get much more qualitative 
data. Um, you can also ask follow-up questions. You can react immediately. You have the chance to respond. So I think for us, the combination of both worked great for us. The survey was a great way of narrowing down which um, topics or areas we should focus on. And then the listening sessions were a great way to um, dive deeper and really understand the root causes of, of the areas where we wanted to improve. Yeah, I hear you saying a lot about the quantitative data being able to really pull out the difference in experience across locations. Uh, as well as areas that, okay, this is clearly an area of focus that we need to follow up on. Uh, in regards to this discrepancy of experience that might occur across locations, I would imagine that is particularly interesting on a global team. Um, if we could back up to implementation before those results come out, um, what challenges did you face in implementing this survey tool globally? You mm -hmm. talked about you touch every continent. What challenges exist with trying to roll out a survey? And then how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah. So I would say quite a few. I mean, of course, if you are doing a global survey, the first thing you need to think about is that all materials need to be translated into various languages. And not only translating it, but also ensuring that everything is worded in a culturally appropriate way. So you cannot just send the questions to an external translation company. You need to pay attention to terminology. Is it the way how we talk within our company, within Barry V. Miller? So that was um, one challenge. Um, but we had plenty of time from the Chapman and Co. to review all translations, so that went, went fine. Another challenge that we faced was that we have some international locations where we have works councils. So specifically in Germany, works councils have to um, approve any kind of employee survey. And this approval process can sometimes be lengthy and, and time consuming and we didn't really have a lot of time since we all wanted to go live on the same day. So um, in our case that worked relatively well. I think first of all because we have good relationships with our works council and we also try to involve them as early as possible in the process to give them plenty of time to ask questions or, or raise their concerns. Um, and I think another challenge was that we needed to be mindful that um, in some areas of the world we have team members that don't have access to computers or who are not familiar with working with computers. So I think by offering to complete the survey via a QR code using your mobile phone, um, I believe we were able to overcome the challenge and give everyone the opportunity um, to participate. And lastly, I would say another challenge when doing a global survey is that there are cultural differences in how team members respond. I think Europeans tend to be very direct with their feedback. They don't hold back. Um, they are not scared to say what's on their mind. On the other hand, I would say our Asian team members they, they are very polite and they are more prone to highlight the positives. So I think it's more difficult to get the real to the real issues that we need to improve um, depending on, on what culture team members come from. So I think taking those differences into consideration when we were interpreting the data, that helped us to kind of overcome that challenge. Uh, yeah, you bring up sort of a fascinating point of there's a lot of consideration on the front end in terms of language, but more even so than definition, the meaning behind language and how we're translating that culturally. Um, but really fascinating on the output of, hey, people are culturally responding different. And we have this standardized set of survey questions that we're trying to use to gather localized insights. So how did you balance that standardized set of survey questions and the fact that we have our European friends responding really directly, our Asian friends responding really politely? Um, how did you balance that standardized set with the the need for localized insights. Yeah, so I think the um, standardized questions, they really helped us to identify areas where we needed to dig deeper. So the questions mm -hmm. may not have given us all of the information or all of the detail that we needed in order to take action, but it did help us to carve out topics or themes that we wanted to hear more about. So um, we, after we have received the results, um, 
20 responses, we then hosted local listening sessions specific to those topics. Um, and we hosted those sessions at all of our global locations. And some of the themes were more globally applicable. So we addressed them from the center and came up with global action items. And then we had other topics that were more local or more location specific. We did host those local listening sessions and that some of the themes that came out of the survey were applicable globally. So we were addressing those topics from the center and took global action items. But then there were other um, topics or themes that came up only at one particular location. So we addressed those topics locally within the local um, leadership teams. Yeah, so a balanced approach between the centralized, hey, what is what needs to occur across all of our locations? And then locally saying, hey, there are needs that are going to exist just here and we're going to dig in deeper to those. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, one of the ways that surveys are most effective is actually just getting people to respond. Um, and the only way that you know those localized insights or those global themes is if you have enough responses to validate that. Um, and you all did very well in gathering responses. Um, I think the global benchmark for a manufacturing survey response rate is probably around 50 or even just below that. Um, and you all were nearly 70%, if I recall. Um, mm -hmm. What did you find as the effective strategy to gather those responses to actually be able to pull out the themes and say, hey, here's what people are saying? Yeah. So um, I think, of course, it helped that the survey was anonymous and we did in all of our communications, whether it was on a poster or a town hall meeting, we made sure that the team knows um, we won't know who said what, it will be anonymous. Um, I also think that it helped that the results that were shared with us made it impossible for us to draw conclusions on which individual said what, because the results were clustered in a way where we would only see responses by groups, for example, by function or by location. So we also emphasized that when we were um, communicating and promoting the survey. And we also emphasized over and over again that we can only improve if you share your voice with us. We want to know what to improve, but we need to hear from you how and what can we improve. And we made sure that the team members understood that the survey is a chance to be heard. And we explained that in all of our communication. So overall, we were very happy with the participation rates that we got. Yeah. It sounds like the anonymity being crucial, but also just a commitment to action. Hey, we, mm -hmm. we want to improve and we want your voice to drive that. Yes, and I hope that now team members saw that we did take action so that for the next survey we have even higher participation since they hopefully experienced we are taking action on, on what we've heard. Absolutely. I'm curious, in your seat as a people leader, uh, you were probably looking very much forward to quantifiable culture data telling you about your people and what they need. What was your team's reaction to this quantifiable yeah. culture data for the first time? I think overall, the reaction was quite positive. I think we all saw it as an op opportunity to learn and to improve. Um, of course, we all knew that a survey also means um, we have to take follow-up items. It will take a lot of time from the people team, from our leadership teams. So we did know it would be time consuming. So there was some concern around capacity. But overall, I think the excitement and desire to learn about what areas can we focus on to improve and um, outweigh the concerns on, on the work that <laughs> we had to do. So I think overall the team felt excited about it. Yeah. And then what was your process for digging through those results when you had them? How did you analyze them, pull out the yeah. insights that you knew mm -hmm. were crucial? So Chapman and co, I think, <laughs> did a really great job of preparing the data for us in a way where I think we could easily say what are the, see what are the main themes um, on a global level, what are the themes on a local level. So, of course, we, we also, I did take the time to read through every single comment and that team members were able to share in the open comment question. But I think the summaries that we received from Chapman and co, they really um, made it easy for us to identify areas that we wanted to dig deeper and learn more about. And when we then determined to do a listening session for each of those themes or topics that we heard, 
Um, we ask then our local HR teams, our local leadership teams um, to hold or to conduct those listening sessions. And team members could then sign up for whichever topic interested them. So it was a voluntary listening session. And through those listening sessions, we were then able to gather even more data and hear directly from the teams um, on those topics that we had carved out what, how and what we can improve. There's a couple really important things that I want to call out for the listeners. And the first is that if you just heard, Yasmin said, I read through every single comment. And I want to go back to the beginning where, if you remember, Yasmin has nearly 2,000 people within her span of care. Uh, this translates to across, I think we asked four open-ended questions. Yasmin read a novel about her team <laughs> and the way that they were doing and how they were feeling about the organization. So I just applaud you in that, in your care for your team members. I also noticed that, hey, when we dug through these insights and we talk about these cultural differences that exist, we, we let these listening sessions be locally led. They were voluntary, they were locally led, so we can start to pull apart the cultural differences and cultural needs when we recognize that those needs exist and we let the locally driven action occur. Um, so how, Bringing us sort of to this action component, what strategies have you found most effective for taking those insights? We've taken quantitative data, we've dug a little bit deeper with some listening sessions. Uh, what strategies have you found most effective for then moving those into actionable plans for mm -hmm. cultural improvement? So one helpful strategy was the listening sessions because they really helped us to understand what's important for the team, where do we need to improve in. And we actually had a lot of actionable plans that were formed during those listening sessions because team members in the listening sessions had great suggestions and there were some low-hanging fruits where we could easily um, put to action of what we heard from the team. And then after the listening sessions, we actually um, shared what we have heard from the team with the leadership teams, both our global leadership team as well as our local leadership teams. And we then came up with um, actions and assigned them to the appropriate owner set appropriate deadlines. So for each location, we had at least 10 to 20 action items that were assigned to an owner or sometimes a group of owners. And then we had the same for, for the global, more central action items where we assigned them to someone. And then we did regular follow-ups to ensure that those things that we agreed on are actually happening. This is one of the things I think I'm most excited to ask you about here towards the tail end of our conversation together is it about how you're measuring the impact then of those changes. And I know your mm -hmm. team has worked very hard not only to carry out those actions, uh, but to re-engage team members to hold yourselves accountable to the change you want to see. Um, so tell us more about how you're measuring the impact of those changes implemented and just overall how that's going. So actually for two of our locations, one in the US and one in Germany, we recently launched a Pulse survey. And the Pulse survey was kept very brief, very simple, mostly asking the team if they found that the actions that we took since the survey are positive. And we also did another check on the NPS, the Net Promoter Score, to see if it improved um, compared to a year ago. So I think that Pulse survey was a good indicator for us to see whether we are heading in the right direction or not. And other than that, we did have location or function specific action items that we regularly checked in with the team to make sure we are making progress. But I would say that that's probably an area that we could improve the next time we do a global survey. <laughs> I think why we, we did and we, we are tracking and we are making progress, but I think we could have done a better job in in, in tracking the action items in a more centralized way. I think right now we have a lot of local action items owner. All of them know what they're doing. But if you would ask me, I could probably not give you a 100% reliable list on what all of our global actions are. At Chapman & Co, we have a term that we love to use, which is called even better if, of saying, hey, that was great, but it could be even better if yes. we did it. <laughs> Sounds like for your team, Yasmin, that went great. And it could be even better if we tweak this the next yes, time. For sure. Yes. <laughs> Any 
last words of wisdom you would leave with global teams um, or domestic teams looking, thinking about running a culture survey? Well, for us overall, it was a great experience. I think it was helpful for us, for the leadership teams to understand um, what we can do to create an even better culture. And I also think that it was greatly appreciated by our team members. And I think if you would ask them now, most of them would give you a positive response in the way that they can see action. There's always room for improvement. And I'm sure next time we do a survey, we will find out more things that we can improve on. But I think overall, it was a very positive experience for everyone involved. You can learn more about organizational culture surveys and Chapman & Co. at ccoleadership.com. And there you can also contact them to see how they can help your organization. And don't forget to find us and connect on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and threads at Barry Waymiller. And you'll find more podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening.